I'm going to say something, you know, intro-wise in a second, but I just wanted to start out, I was like, just in case something happened, I want my main point to be heard at the beginning and the end. Uh, so nothing else on it. Look, the black arts era constitutes the most important moment in African-American literary history. By, I want to say by far, but I'm going to just go ahead and be nice and say by enough. Okay. Uh, something that Howard said yesterday, which I found really interesting, is that Baraka today is as much a, uh, a, black, uh, uh, a black arts person as he was in the 60s. But you know, he sort of has refined it. Uh, and I think that's true. I hadn't really, I, I hadn't really thought about that. But there, and I think I was thinking about it as a contradiction, but it's not. It's just that there are certain elements, the positive elements of black art. Uh, which he has, which he has kept. Uh, uh, it is uh, quite an honor to talk to uh, poetry scholars, uh, particularly about Alan Polite, uh, and to uh, talk to poets. Uh, I know many of you are accomplished poets, and I uh, am, am quite honored. So one of the purposes that I have here uh, today is to, uh, to try to uh, incite your interest in Alan Polite and some of the other poets that I'm uh, going to talk about uh, and hand over this, uh, this investigation of uh, African-American poets in Scandinavia to, to very fine hands, very fine critics that you are. So I'm hoping that as, um, as we go along that your interest will peak and that you will uh, take up this charge. Well, it was really just out of my own feeling that I decided and when I stumbled on the poem and I said, oh my, that's beautiful and so, so and I put this in and, and then I found, I found a drawing that, oh, that is exactly a, like an illustration to the poem or, or, uh, uh, or something and I just put it in. The best place to go is to this book that was published last year, which is online and, and openly available called Debates in the Digital Humanities and it talks uh, about I and mean, has article it gathers together many previously published articles uh, on teaching on research on all kinds of issues within the digital humanities so plenty of, of reading material there but in general I, I, I think of it as just uh, kind of the intersection of computers and humanities so it could be um, using uh, computational tools uh, and methods from computer science to do humanistic, to, to look at humanistic questions. Uh, that could be text mining, uh, data visualization, GIS and mapping, um, looking at, and uh, Howard had mentioned big data, so lots of projects looking at uh, uh, data and trying to find patterns uh, through those. There's this woman named Rosie Poole. She shows up to Fisk to do a presentation, and she reads his poem, and he's very impressed. He's like, wow, she made that sound really good. So <laughs> he went and revised the poem and then sent it to her and said, you know, I, I considered this poem a failure. He says, I heard you read and it made me like it more. Now, he was, it was kind of a little sly thing. He said, I liked it so much when you read it, so I went and revised it. I mean, I think that's kind of funny, right? Like, <laughs> I liked how you read, it, read this, so I went and changed it. Anyway. <laughs> and she encouraged me to do some projects around um, African American Literature with Textual Scholarship. And I, didn't, I couldn't think of anything to do. And I was always into Richard Wright. He's been the person. But the big thing about Richard Wright, I was saying, is I was like, uh, all the people who have done the important things with Wright. So I was trying to figure out what I could do, so I blended textual scholarship, Richard Wright. Just happened to come across the old bookstore that had um, first edition Native Son and Black Boy, and they were selling for $2, so you know. Oh, wow. I got all of those. <laughs> you know, I was amazed, and I'm still amazed, that Howard Ramsey went all the way through from undergrad to grad studying with friends of mine, brothers. With a P I mean, got a PhD. <laughs> studying, uh, going all the way from undergrad to, to a PhD and studied with black scholars. I mean, that, that still has me reeling. As I said, we just, you know, we read it 
and you know five minutes sometimes up to five minutes before the actual class you were completing what you because you know when were you going to read it you're out of grad school you're working so but we did the work and as tony morrison said at a function not too long ago we were tough <laughs> we were tough everybody had their coltrane poem he was this central exciting figure and the other central exciting figure is malcolm x and it is kind of interesting uh I just repeat everything Howard said. Uh, 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 Malcolm X had the style, and Coltrane had the great, great music. But people really imitate, uh, imitate Coltrane, and to the point of you know wearing his glasses and putting their finger over there. I mean, you know, so the so that part of the style of of of. Uh, of, of Mal did I say called him Malcolm X Continuum? I meant Malcolm X. Okay, so in anticipation of the meeting, because I saw this week that um, they had assigned you to read something from my first book, The Muse is Music, I decided I'd read a poem that's in it, even though it's a book of scholarship, and I do see myself as a scholar of poetics, but I work through poetry to achieve that. And the poem is actually called Post Soul Train. poems about my mother and this whole question of gender gender and gender role comes up in these poems because uh, here is a woman who was just you know qu quite brilliant uh, a wonderful organizer uh, but the way things were set up at that time you know she really couldn't she really didn't have a role a and a part of that uh, made her just a furious human being and such a furious human being, there were lots of people who didn't like her, you know. Um, so, a guy in a black SUV. As I slowly inched toward the toll booth, a guy in a black SU SUV cuts in front of me, pretends I'm not there, edges forward in his massive black machine. I mutter, but do nothing. However, if this guy had done this to my mother, she would, without a second's hesitation, slammed her car into his, leaped out of hers, smashed her his windshield with a crowbar while swearing at him like a wild woman. 
And as the guy would jump out of his vehicle, running toward her, screaming, are you crazy? She would swiftly kick him in the nuts. <laughs> and as he would crumble to the ground holding his privates, this, magnific mag this magnificent fury beyond his comprehension, he would, simply, he would simply reiterate, are you crazy? What a woman. <laughs> I can see my mother always dressed in an immaculate white blouse in her yellow sports car, her concentration perfect behind the wheel, driving 80, 90 miles per hour, a hundred dollar bill in her kangaroo wallet. If she, if caught, she will pay the fine with a little bitterness and a little showbiz, dramatically flapping down the C note. She knows the precise worth of her fun. Thank you.